Today in Across the Fence, a book that's been years in the making and touches every community in Vermont. We'll explore Something Abides, discovering the Civil War in today's Vermont. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. For nearly a decade, Vermont historian and Civil War expert Howard Coffin scoured each and every town in Vermont. His goal was to identify landmarks and document sites in Vermont that were in some way touched by the Civil War. Coffin's task is now complete and the result is a magnificent new book, Something Abides. It's a pleasure to have Howard with us this afternoon to learn about the book and hear some of the stories. Great to have you back. Nice to be here again, Judy. <laughs> well, the title, Something Abides, where does that come from? It comes from a speech that was given at Gettysburg uh, 20 years after the Civil War by Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, one of the great heroes of Gettysburg, and he spoke in dedicating the main monuments. He said, in great deeds something abides, on great fields something stays, forms change and past bodies disappear, but spirits linger to consecrate ground for the vision place of souls. Chamberlain was saying, where great things happen, something lingers. And I think I've found that you don't need a battlefield to find that. Which is exactly what the book is about. Yes. Um, is there another book like this? Well, according to Jim McPherson, who's the best Civil War historian alive today, uh, he kindly did the forward for this book. And he says, no, there's never been a book written like this about any state. And so how many Civil War sites did you find? I haven't really sat down and gone one, two, three, but uh, it looks to me about 2,500. Wow. And so tell me a little bit about how you first got the idea to do this book. And as you were going through it, how maybe the idea changed a little bit? <laughs> Well, 20 years ago, before I wrote my first Civil War book, I had this idea to write a book about Civil War sites in Vermont. I took it to Countryman Press. They said, what you really want to do, but don't quite dare, is write a history of Vermont in the Civil War. Write that, we'll publish it. I wrote it, they published it. 20 years later, I went back to them, and this time they said yes. Okay, tell me a little bit about what it took to get these stories. Uh, it was tough going. I, I went to every town, and many towns I went to four and five times, 150,000 miles on the car, went through three cars. <laughs> I really had to go to the town clerk, find out who was interested in, civil, in the Civil War history, and then start digging. Had a lot of local help, but every, every town was a research project, and some of them were tough going. Mm -hmm. And so this took years and years. Was there ever a time when you said, oh, this is just too much, I'm just... I've it took it. me six years, and there were probably a hundred times when I said, this is too much, <laughs> but it's, it's done. Do you have any favorite sites? What are some of your favorite stories? Uh, I have many, many favorite sites. It's the ones that are less well known that I really like, although I think the best site in the book is the State House. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's remarkable. But uh, there's a hilltop up above Gill Hall where you can see the twists and turns of the Connecticut River. It was a favorite picnic spot back in the, before the Civil War. After the war started, the, the local people noticed that the turns of the Connecticut River spelled Union. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yes. Goshen, in Goshen, uh, the town hall still stands in Goshen. Early in the war, three lads from Goshen were killed in one battle. It was the war hit home for the first time, and they called a special town meeting and they passed resolutions. They were angry and sad and frustrated. They passed one resolution expressing the hope that our nation will extricate itself from the foul rebellion forced upon us by traitors so that the stars and stripes can float over this state as long as wood shall grow and water run. Amazing, isn't it? It's beautiful. Wonderful uh, language. Uh, in Island Pond, there was a woman named Samantha Stevens. She had three sons. She was a widow. Uh, she walked two miles into town to see her sons off on the train. Two of them were killed in the war. The third one came home crippled. During the war, she went into town almost every night to help the other women make things for the soldiers and she built her own house while they were away, which still stands uh, outside of Island Pond. That's a remarkable site, and it really gets at the contribution that the women made. Th that is part of the story, too, is the contributions that people on the home front were doing. Yeah, I think this book maybe gets 
as much at what happened on the home front as any book that's been written. And the burdens uh, fell on running the state, running the farms, running the factories, fell on the women, fell on the children, on the elderly people. Uh, it was a remarkable performance. Uh, I don't know how they did it. There was a great relief, of course, Judy, when the war finally ended, when word came to Vermont that uh, Robert E. Lee's army had been defeated, that the Confederate capital had fallen. Everybody in Chittenden County headed where? To celebrate? To the village of Richmond, <laughs> because Richmond was the name of the capital of the Confederacy, and they just automatically went there. A grand celebration. Fireworks, yeah, I mean, and, and it's amazing because you know, no phone trees, you know, no text or emails. People just did this. They just did this. It was they saw it in the papers, and off they went and had a heck of a time. Why do you think it's important to have this kind of a history written about a particular state or area of the country? Well. One of the important things about this book is that, that I found out as I moved through Vermont that I was getting there just in time. Too often I walked into a town clerk's office, asked to see, uh, to be uh, told who the local historian was, and the answer would be, oh, I'm sorry, but she passed away last month. But most of the people I got valuable information from are older people, and I'm 71. This book was written uh, just in time. And there is a story to be told about the totality of war. What was, what's war really like? We don't know that so much in America because we really haven't had a war fought here for a long time. And with this book, uh, you can take your time and wander about Vermont and uh, find out something of that experience. And I hope have a lot of fun. Well, here's the thing. I mean, not only do you talk about the sites, you give directions to yes. the sites. Yes, I do give directions, and I want to give this caution that using this book, you're going to find some mistakes in the directions, I'm sure, because I, it took so long that I didn't have time to drive back through it all mm -hmm. to check on all the turns, lefts and rights and so forth. If you find mistakes, there's information in here in the book how to contact me, and the, I'll make uh, corrections in the second printing. So please help me edit it out there, Vermonters. And I suggested too to people, if get the book and keep it in your car. Yes. Because you find yourself traveling and you say, oh, here, I'm in this town. Let me look up at the book and see what I can find and, and check it out. Oh, yes, and I did go to every town, 251, so you'll find something. <laughs> you'll find something in every town. All right, well, as you've learned about the Vermont Civil War sites and landmarks over the years, you shared some of the stories with us at Across the Fence, and there are several stories from Vermont's largest city. So here's Howard in Burlington to unveil some of the city's Civil War history. Our story begins here on South Willard Street in Burlington, a city that was a hotbed of abolition before the Civil War. Joshua Young lived here, and he and his wife in this house harbored escaped slaves. They were part of the Underground Railroad. Young also was pastor at the Unitarian Church at the head of Church Street. In 1859, he went to the Adirondacks to North Elba and presided at the funeral of John Brown. For that, he lost his job as pastor. Not everyone in Burlington opposed slavery. This house on the UVM campus was the Benedict family home. The Benedicts were abolitionists. They harbored fugitive slaves here. They also published the Burlington Free Press. George Grenville Benedict, the son, went to war with the 14th Vermont, became an aide to General George Stannard, and won a Medal of Honor at Gettysburg. So in this city by the lake, the fiery issues of freedom and slavery that would lead to the Civil War were burning hotter and hotter. And when the war began, the drumbeats of the encampment of the 2nd Vermont Regiment on the fairgrounds could be heard up here. The 1st Vermont Cavalry was forming less than a mile away. The students here at UVM took up the patriotic fever and 190 of them went off to war. 10 of them fought with the Confederacy. The human cost of all of that can be seen in the Dewey Lounge, the old university chapel in the old mill. 
But as you stand here in the subdued light of stained glass windows, it's easy to recall that this was once the college chapel. And it later became a Civil War shrine because a plaque was placed on the wall in honor of the 19 UVM students and graduates who died during the Civil War. For instance, the first name, Charles Jarvis, class of 1839, son of a Vermont congressman, was killed near New Bern, North Carolina with the 9th Vermont Regiment. James Marsh Reed, class of 1853 in the 10th Vermont Regiment, died of wounds sustained at the Battle of Cedar Creek. Stephen Foster Spaulding, class of 1868 Vermont, was killed in the suicidal assault at Port Hudson on the Mississippi River. And James Worthington Woodward, class of 1862, his father was chaplain of the 1st Vermont Cavalry. Woodward went to war as a captain with the Vermont Cavalry, served until after Gettysburg when he learned of his fiancee's death. He became reckless and in a skirmish following Lee's retreat from Gettysburg in a battle near Hagerstown, Maryland, he was mortally wounded. One soldier who came home when peace finally came had a unique perspective on the war and on his home state. Well, finally, it was over. The long war had ended. The 2nd Vermont Regiment came back from four years of war to Burlington. One of its most famous members was Wilbur Fisk, who had been a correspondent throughout the war, sending his letters home to a Montpelier newspaper. When he reached Burlington, he came up to the UVM campus and found some old friends and they took him to the high vantage point of the old mill building's cupola. I had the good fortune, he said, to be treated to a view from the college belfry. I don't know of anything that could be more delightful to a four-year soldier than to stand upon the tip top of an institution like that in one's own native state. Quite a respectable portion of the country that a man may be proud to say he was born in can be seen from there. The smooth lake on one side, pent up by rugged mountains all around, and the other side, the hills and valleys, forests and fields, entertain the eye. Just amazing stories. They're everywhere. Yeah. Can you have some examples of some other sites, too? There's a field in Vernon, uh, Vermont, uh, where um, a repeating cannon was tested before the Civil War. A man in Vernon invented a repeating cannon that fired six shots in a row like a machine gun. And the War Department, Jefferson Davis, still with the Union, sent a committee up to look at it and they test fired it and it blew up, the breach blew up. And so they went back to Washington and they never tried to perfect it. If they had, it would have changed the war. There's a house right near that where a young lady uh, sat uh, on summer afternoons and just and wrote in her diary and casually mentions the passing of trains filled with wounded, wounded from the Overland campaign headed for the Vermont military hospitals. House is still there, porch is still there. That's amazing. Now people are probably gonna find other sites. Do you still wanna document stories and can people contact oh, you? Oh yes. Uh, they can call me, as I say, the contact information is in my book, and I have a website, just Howard Coffin, Civil War, mm -hmm. and let me know, because uh, they're out there. Well, it would be great if every middle school, I think, in the state had a copy of this book and could send kids out to find their own, to find the sites and do like a scavenger hunt. There is nothing, there's no subject that interests children in history like the Civil War. It's a fascinating story, and teachers tell me that if they can show the kids a place where something Civil War related happened, it makes that teaching all the more easy. So It was just amazing that buildings that we pass every day have a history like that. Well, with this book, uh, you, you may be surprised that that old house next door was the place uh, where a soldier lived or where a woman welcomed in the neighbors to make clothing and uh, put together foodstuffs for the soldiers. Okay, we've got about 30 seconds left. You wrote this book for the 150th anniversary of the Civil War and you're glad you made it. 
Am I glad I made it? I, I'm glad I made it before <laughs> the anniversary ends. And this summer, I'm on the way to the 150th anniversary of Gettysburg. There's going to be a massive reenactment. And I'm going to be down there with Mark Hudson from the Historical Society. We're going to be signing books and trying to convince people to come to Vermont and see the Civil War, because Vermont looks more like the Civil War time than any state in the Union. I want to thank you so much for sharing your stories with us. Thank you, Judy. Wonderful that, to be here. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. For a video copy of today's program, call toll-free 1-888-ATF-3430. Across the Fence is brought to you as a public service by University of Vermont Extension and WCAX-TV.